So hello, hello and welcome. Now we are back with sound. So today we are all about the Sixmax Hyper Turbo satellites. And these Hyper Turbo satellites are probably the best way to use your FPP points. And at first I'm going to show you a tip on how to not get playing to a tournament that takes for ages. Like when you are selecting the Hyper, you can say, see where it's the satellite to. And when you click here, it opens the tournament lobby. And now we can see that if we want to play the 235 FPP satellites that are available for this $11 no limit hold'em. So we have one hour and 24 minutes. So should be enough. And this is something that when you are playing Six Max Hyper Satellites, you'll always want to see when does the tournament where the satellite is to is starting. Because generally, if you, are, if you want to play these satellites, you are playing them because you are only having a little time. And when you are having a little time, it's quite a catastrophe to get in a tournament that takes, takes like 10 hours to complete. And usually the satellites are for the Sunday storm, so they are great to play in any day that's not a Sunday. And on Sunday they are even better than usual because on Sunday, on Sunday there are a lot of players that are recreational and they want to get to play the Sunday storm. So these games are going to be at their softest on Sundays. And we are going to try to do about keeping about four tables. The average game length in these games is between two and three minutes. So these games are going to be very short. And we are going to see games that I'm going to be eliminated in the first hand. And this might as well be one. Like any suited ace from any position is a, is a shove. It's a profitable shove. The worst offsuit aces from UTGR, practically not shoves. In here, when an unknown player limps, I'm thinking that the limps are generally weak. So I'm trying to attack those. They might be... Someone might limp aces, some other players are. And when you are just seeing that, then you are just making a note. But there are plenty of those players that are limping a very weak hand and they are limp folding. I don't know what the guy did with King 7 off. And when we are in a middle stack, these games are so ICM heavy. And in this situation, we don't want to risk money against this Don Gardi. We are quite close to getting the money just if we are if we are abusing the guy that's having the shortest stack, so we don't want to give the guy extra chips. And in general, I think that the people are folding too much, too much in blind versus blind situations. So I'm going pretty wide in those situations, even against unknowns. For it to be not profitable for me to shove close to any two, there would need to have a dirty wide calling range for the player with a medium stack. And now we are actually getting to an interesting spot when we are in the bubble and we are having a pretty interesting situation because we are about even stacked. So when we are about even stacked, it's going to be, it's going to be a harder game for us to play. And here I mean three bet to try to entice these players to for getting this player all in, so this is kind of like, how, how do you say it? It's not collusion, but it's going to be that if you know that what you are doing with a big stack, you should be... You should be, and in here I actually missed a, missed a bet here. I should have bet, bet this flop when my opponent just called. And it could have been a bluff. I was too busy trying to add new tables for the tables that have dropped. So as you can see here, these games are going to be quick. And even though I said that any two cards can be profitable to shove from small blind, there are some situations that you want to rather min race. 
And those situations are mainly if you are having a situation that that guys are going to fold too much anyways. And in this situation, when we are three-handed and we are back to shove stacks, it's usually the bravest guy that wins the game in these situations. And as Bababu said that that was quick, yeah, we were... It's easier for Deja to cut these videos to YouTube when if I'm having a technical problem, I'm having the video to mark the moment. Uh, A7 suited is going to be, even against the unknown guy, it's going to be a profitable call. And in these games, when we are seeing that the antes are so high as they are, like these antes are double what they are in usual in the usual sit and go hypers so these antes are huge and we are starting 10 big blinds deep so this means that we are going to going to have a shove fest here and there are situations that we might limp there are situations that we might we might min raise. This is about hiding my stack size because I don't think if I shove I can ever get a fold. But I might get some folds when I'm just min raising and my opponent doesn't look the stack size correctly. It doesn't matter in this case. Our opponent had a great hand and he would have. I think he would have three bet the general button opener as well. And chip leader, what do you mean that saying that these games are ICM heavy? These are practically triple or nothings. There are there is a third place finish. No, in or in here, like third place gets ten uh, ten frequent player points back. And the two first finishers are both getting a ticket to the Sunday Storm or whatever eleven dollar game they are running. So. In these games, it's it's like a double or nothing, but it's a triple or nothing. So when we are in the bubble, it's one of the most bubble heavy structures there is. Or I think it's the most bubble heavy structure of all poker star structures. And now I mean the real bubble, like the 10 FPPs. I don't know even why they why they bother to put in the 10 FPP price, because it doesn't matter. Like we are never playing to get the third third place finish. So we are never slow playing when we are three handed or four handed to get to three handed. Mm. I'm thinking that have we seen enough that it's not going to be a that it's at, that it would not be a any two shove from the small blind. And I don't think that we have have seen enough hands. But generally, if a guy doesn't fold fold his big blind to steal something like 60 or 70 percent, most of the guys do. Then it's going to be that it's going to be not profitable to shove any two there. Uh, Chip Leader said that, do you think that the 3.75 dollars are softer than the 235 FPPs? I mean, there are not so many fish around with endless FPPs. I actually think that it's going to be the exact opposite. That all the money hypers have been... I think they have been tougher than the FPP hypers. In these FPP games, it's going to be that... There are always some players that want to get the FPP seat and here are a lot of cash game players like you don't need to you don't need to have a winning a winning win percentage to gain an advantage in these games like if you're a cash cash game player and you gain something like 32% in the money finishes. If you're gaining 32% in the money, so you are worse than an average player. Even then you are having a better deal than if you would have, if you purchased a Platinum Star bonus from the VIP store. So in these games, 
I think that there are always going to be players that have not put enough effort in the games. This Jack 3 is actually close. I think that as it's such a bad hand, I'd rather take the next hand pretty much no matter what. And Albert Tick. It's going to be nasty. I think that he's going to shove, shove wide enough that nine, uh, ace nine off is going to be a profitable call. You could actually, actually check that later on that if it's going to be a profitable call or not. And in here, when we are having less than two big blinds and we are not in the bubble, we are basically calling. And I think this guy made a mistake in there. And I think I would be making a mistake because Sally Ali shouldn't fold if I'm shoving that. And I don't like the amount of chips that I'm getting the getting to the first or second place. It doesn't matter. So it just does matter that I'm not I'm not being stupid and lose the lose the large stack. So in these games, it doesn't the gaining of chips doesn't matter that much. Uh, three five off. We are getting 20, 25 percent. So, and we are not risking a lot. And in these situations, when there are the smallest stack and then the medium stack calls, I don't think that there is any point in betting at any point of the hand. And oh, he let yeah. That's. That's what happens that you are, you can convert and as I said, a good player in these games will manage 30, I think 36 percentage ish is available. And in the, in the bottom right, like if this would be in the bubble already and I think just that when we are having such a situation that there's a guy that limps and there's a really short stack. He's probably having a great hand in this situation. What the freak. So I can't even like he put in 200 extra bucks on his stack with 6-3 off, 6-3 uh, suited and for practically no gain at all. Hmm. 33 percentage is required. I think it's going to be okay because this guy will get the... His range is not that strong and he's going to get the pretty equal stack to Sally Ali no matter what I do. And I don't risk that much in calling there. And I let, why are you saying this that he won the pot with the 6-3 off, 6-3 uh, suited? I'm saying that because with the 6-3 suited, if you are taking part, if you are taking part in a hand with 6-3 suited, uh, with a caller here, I don't think 6 is good enough, but without a caller, I would have called in a heartbeat. So with 363 suited, you are just getting closer to the guy. Like if you are not taking part in any hand when you are a medium stack, you are then basically you are guaranteed to get the money and you are still having a larger stack even when the shortest stack doubles up. But if you are playing that hand, the 63 suited, then the during the next hands, Then during the next hands, if you are playing the 6-3 suited, there's the shortest stack on the table that had 300 chips. Then when he doubles up, he's going to have a larger stack than you. And then you are going to be the short stack that's going to face elimination. So I'm thinking that calling with 6-3 suited in that sense just increases the, just increases the opportunity to opportunity to get out without the money even though you are having a having a good stack size these are just pot odds calls 
and this is go this is quite nasty. And with like 100 and 200 chips, we are going all in with eight twos off if if we are getting this pot unopened. But we didn't, so it doesn't matter in this situation. There's a good point for a thriller to min raise even the weaker hands because the Albert tick is having such a big stack. In these situations, like you don't want to be colliding with the big stack pretty much ever. And this is because of the ICM heavy structure. So if you are having the big stack, you don't want to collide with other big stacks. It's usually really, really unprofitable. And Ahille as you said that then you can convert tournament dollars into dollars by playing the 50, 50s SNGs. You can unblock 1 to 2k in a day. I think like in these games you could also convert something like 1 or 2k. I played a few tables of these on the side of the Supernova free roll. And something like seven to eight tables of these. The most of the decisions are quite easy. And when I had the seven or eight tables of these, I think it was something like 80, 80 games of these per hour, which is something like 10,000 or actually 20,000 FPPs converted, converted in an hour. So, so even with four tables, Going through your FPPs is not going to take a long time. Like if you are playing four tables of these, we can actually see how how many games can we get through. But on average, they are taking about two to three minutes. So if we would have had like this table, four tables going at all times, then I'd say that we would be we would be quite close to quite close to hitting sixty to or 50 or 60 tables an hour. And that even means that we are playing something like 11,000 uh, FPPs an hour. Uh, from the UTG, I don't think the weakest aces are good enough, but when we are just eight big blinds deep and there is one player already eliminated, then I think that offsuit ace is going to be good enough. Suited aces are going to be good enough at the first hand already. So I think like in these games, games it's going to be that there are some cash game players that are converting their points and this is why I think this is probably one of the most useful most useful coaching sessions for a uh, for cash game player as well because in these games and combine it with sit and goes or selling your tournament dollars it's going to be the best percentage you can get and it doesn't take a long time to convert your points to points to dollars and for something like 10,000 VPPs it's going to be like uh, if you are just an average player in these games it's going to be worth something like $155 and if you are better than average it can be worth it can be worth to close to 200 so and if you are purchasing a 10,000 uh, 10,000 FPP bonus, I think it's going to be around 100 bucks, so... So a good player in these games would be... Could be catching pretty much double the double his share than purchasing the Silver Star or Gold Star. In here, I... Even though this guy hasn't opened a single hand, I think A7 is going to be strong enough to shove here. And it's going to be in these games that the blinds and antes are going to get so high so quickly that the ranges are going, the shove ranges are going to be wider than what you would normally expect in a sit and go. And in here, when we are the sort of stack around. If it would be like here would be a 110 chip stack, this would be an insta fall, but now it's going to be a be an instant call. And it would have been instant call with pretty much any two cards because of the stack sizes and effective stacks. And in here, 
if we are having something like pair of jacks, we are just open folding. Or not open folding, but we are folding to the largest tax race. This is how I see and heavy these are. I, I might even think about fo open uh, folding a pocket kingster, but I would probably just call them. Uh, Skiffos is... Yeah, I think the only bonus that I can recommend is the 160... Uh, $1,600 bonus, that's the supernova bonus. And it's only worth it because I think that you are getting better better hourly doing something else than... And in these games, I think like the Sunday Million satellites are also going to be... Like in here, if we're looking at the 4500 chip game, it's it looks a bit insane. That there are three good hyper turbo players in the same game. It's probably softer than a seventy dollar hyper in general, but it's not. It's not at even at the same limits of softness as these games. Sometimes there are really good games that start with four thousand five hundred VPPs, but when there are those guys waiting, I don't think it's going to be that profitable of a game for me. Mm, seven eight suited, seven eight suited. It's going to be close, but these kind of a suited connectors, they are getting some value that they are playing well even against tighter calling ranges. And again, if this guy would have shoved ten big bl uh, one thousand chip stack here, I would have folded. But against uh, five hundred chip stack, so that we are not, we would not be the two largest stacks. And as Kalyan said, that fish is like you're evading easy dollars. I'm thinking that they are everything but easy. And in these games that we need to adjust to the fact that there are going to be weak players. So if we are seeing a situation that if a player does a weak player thing and doesn't like know that this situation is something that he should fold anything but pocket jacks or better. We are not shoving those situations. If it's going to be that we are going to easily get screwed if an opponent calls a pretty hand, in those situations we are we are trying to avoid a collision. So it's going to also be not about being stupid. I think in here that we are we are ahead with head with a jack when this guy limps from the small blind and now I'm having problems seeing anything that we would beat when a guy hasn't limped before I'm actually thinking that he's having a better hand and then when there are two over cards like every decent hand that our opponent might limp trap with is going to beat us at that moment. And in these games it's like it's not going to be about going for Nash ranges. If you are like going for Nash ranges and calling with Nash ranges in these games against average opponents, you are going to lose so much equity. Because these guys are not going to shove us wide as Nas would dictate. And also as they are not calling correctly, it opens up spots for us to be exploiting our general opponents. But like Skifosis, if I'm comparing like with the $1600 for 100,000 FPPs, it's like 16 per... Uh, it's going to be like... A 0 0.016 0 0 
One six dollars worth for every. Every FPP and these games are like 0 0.0156. So these are going to be really close to even an average player. And I think every every tournament ticket that you can purchase is priced with the same price. So tournament tickets in general, when you are having a low VIP status and low means everything under Supernova. Sorry about that. It's not boasting, it's just all about how do you get your best rewards. And getting the best rewards when you are outside Supernova pretty much means that you should use your you should use your FPPs for tournament tickets. And these are one of the lowest limit tournament tickets and the I think these are the lowest variance tournament tickets that you can purchase. Because in these games you can convert the money to tournament dollars and tournament dollars you can select the low variance game that you think you are good in to convert the money into real money. And as Kaleon said that then just one needs to remember unregistering from the storm. Yeah, that's highly recommended to get the pro procedure for yourself that you are Instantly, when you have done the games, you are unregistering for the target tournament. And like in here, if we are not unregistered to the target tournament in that starts in one and a half hours, then we are going to then we are going to play a normal regular speed game that takes approximately for a hyper turbo player it takes approximately three forevers to complete it's like when one forever is not enough the sunday storm it's a turbo but usually if you forget to unregister for that then you are out of your computer when it starts. In here, there's enough dead money to money to be co going in with uh, with kind of a weak hand. But with the blinds and antes, we need to take chances when we are when we are the bottom stack. And in here, this guy when he's having a slightly larger stack, we are using his stack as a fold equity for the other guys. So then there will be a lot of dead money in the pot, and it will be. It will be a really profitable situation for us. Whoa. Pocket trees. It's actually close and it's because of all the money in the pot already. If this guy wouldn't have been disconnected, I think it would be an easier fold. But now I'm actually unsure if it's a good if it's a good call or if it's a good fold. Because we are getting extra equity if we know that this guy never calls. And normally it would be something like, especially when this guy is a, is a larger stack, it would be something like pocket fives. That would be a good call there. But so as you can see that these games are really quick, I think the basic basic strategy is also pretty simple. So this can be a pretty low stress way to pretty low stress poker. And actually with a slightly shorter stack, I think pocket four start to be a good call, especially with this guy disconnected. But if you are playing a lot more of these games and like someone like your 95 that's an awesome sit and go player like he's a beast of playing sit and goes and when he's managing to have like one percentage point 
point profit after Supernova Rakeback. This, you'll know that these games are going to be in the high stakes level. You'll need to be really, really good in this. So even though the game is simple on top, like if you are thinking about these games, this look really simple that this is just shove or fold and but when you are thinking about all the situations and all the stack size situations you can you can be in and the amount of mistakes you can make like most hyper games those are not hard games in general the games are made hard by the fact that you are having next to no space to make errors in the game like if the best player in the games is making 1% 1%, 1 percentage point of profit then you'll know that you need to be within one percentage point of the world's best player so and it's going to be really hard but a good point is that in these games actually now we got a good player I think so we can also see how a good player plays in these games And Skifosis said that these games are variance monsters. I think you are quite wrong in that regard. That I think that these games are not variance monsters. I think actually this might have been a mistake to call with Aisten off. I think perhaps Aishak off. Depends on, it depends a lot on how aggressive this guy is. When he's playing on a mobile phone, I'm thinking that he's probably less aggressive. As is like the variance in these games is going to be really low. These are going to be one of the lowest variance poker games that are one of the lowest variance form of tournament poker that you can find. But the point is that you can have still huge downswings even though the variance is low when the attainable edge is low as well. It's going to be that there will be high downswings even though the variance in itself isn't that bad like i think these are with uh, these are less variance filled for form like for instance 50/50s it it's actually pr probably pretty, pretty close to 50/50s in variance but it's still going to be way less variance than the 6 max sit and goes in general or 9 max sit and goes in general. And Aristoteles asks, what amount of buy-ins would you just suggest to grind them? For example, the 3.75s. I think the problem with the cash games is that I tried to grind them once. And I had a lot of problems in starting my sets and moving within the set to move to... Uh, to move to another sit and go with the tournament that you are about to get into and there were a lot of misregistrations for the MTT tournaments that took forever So I'm thinking that these are one of the most stressful format of poker to grind because of the misregistration probability and you need to like More than or like 10 minutes before the sit and go starts because these games can go for 10 minutes if we are unlucky or lucky because usually it means that we are getting money or but for it because the attain attainable ROIs are going to be so low in these games I think the bankroll required is also going to be quite high so if I'm thinking that the general player will even in the lowest stake games, I think that you are, you'll need to, you'll need to put some effort into learning before you are winning, winning even a percentage point. Like, like even, the, or I think that even if a player puts his mind into it, I think that it takes about the same amount of time to learn to beat these for one percentage than it would take to beat the equivalent level of turbo sit and goes for five percent.
And we are having two players with us. So we are now trying to A, we are trying to avoid colliding with the big stack and B, when there are two callers, I'm thinking actually that we are so likely to have the best hand right now that we are we are going for it. If this guy would have called, we would have shoved the river. When this guy calls, we are calling and we are not liking it. I'm thinking that his hand will mostly consist of uh, consist of queens or I don't think that there will be that many aces. Check ten off. Wow. Wow. And this is what you are going to see in these games. He screwed up his biggest stack. Like he would he would have almost already tasted the money or like the dollar bills are all almost floating in the air in front of the monitor and then he just throws them away. I think ace five office. We are not going to. We are not going to risk a lot there. And in here, uh, this is probably what we are seeing from a good player in these games. Like hundred percent. Actually, we are we are not having enough data on him. And actually, actually, if he's shoving one hundred percent, any queen is going to be a decent call. Even against the Nash range, Queen 6 off would actually be a good shove. A good call. So, this is like how dirty wide you need to be. And Skifosi said that when you run bad, you are just going to get crushed a lot more than 50 50s, in my opinion. Like in these games, even though the variance per game, it's going to be about the 1.2 buy ins per game. It's going to be the ex pretty much the exact same as the 50-50s. And it's going to be less than the... It's going to be less than what you would see in... In like 6 max or 9 max general sit and goes that are having the 1.6 buy-ins per game. But if you are comparing like the 3.5 3.5 50-50s where you can, I think you can achieve a 6% ROI. And in this, if you are comparing to 3.75s where I think that if you are good, you can uh, you can have 2 or 3% ROI. But that means that with the same variance, we are going to find 2 to 3 times larger downswings in 6 max hyper satellites than we would find in than we would find in 5050s and the break even length or, or the amount of tournaments that you can even though you are a profitable player that you can play break even are going to be 4 to 9 times as long so and this is this is something that I'm usually a 9 that in like poker scene it's it's about, when you are talking about variance, it's always bad variance. And when you are talking about variance, it's always going to be... It's not going to be talking about variance, but it's going to be talking about downswings. And that's just not what variance is. And it makes talking about variance really hard when you... When you need to make a decision, are you talking about... Variance as variance is, or are you talking about what's generally conceived of variance in poker? And Aristoteles, and he's a gold star. I think that you can achieve, if you are playing some of the higher stakes games, you can achieve pretty much any. This could also have been a min race. Min race fold. And this would have been a better better with a suited hand. I just think that when we are having such a huge pot, we are having great pot odds and... 
With the mobile phone player racing, I'm getting out of it even though I'm getting so great pot odds that... Like 1 in 7 pot odds. Actually that would, that would have been a, been a decent call. Because of the just insane pot odds, but... Being in a pot with... Uh, being in a pot with the largest stack, and actually like preflop call, it's going to be so 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 thin. Uh, on the top left, we are just going to shove. There is so much dead money in the pot. What have you done on the first table? I think you had pot odds two or three hands ago. Let's see. I think it might have been this ace nine off. I actually would have had pot odds against this guy, but when there's a larger stack behind me, then it gets a lot harder. Then it gets a lot harder for me to call as I'm essentially, I'm risking my whole stack. But like also, if you are comparing the 6 max hypers to 50-50s, there is also a point that in in these 6 max hypers, a player that plays them a lot can play... Like these 6 max hyper satellites, I think the players that are playing most of these games... I have, I think one Brazilian guy did something like 40 or 50,000 of these in a month. And the best, in, best for 50-50s I think has been close to 10,000. 50-50s a month, so you are also going to play a lot more of these per hour, and it's it's also what will uh, what will make your felt variance go through the roof as you are playing a very large very large amount of games in a very short amount of time. Time so. In one day, and in here, I would want him to get it all in, because then it's going to be the easiest way for us to us to check it to river. I I might also have been, or it might also have been a good idea to min three bet there to get his stack all in, for sure. And even like King 3 off would look like it's a pretty hand, but we are going to have a collision between these two guys with like 70% of the time and we are gaining equity even though we don't participate in the hand. And if we are participating in the hand, the small blind will call sometimes and the big blind will call with only great hands. So that's, that's a point that we can also gain equity. So compared to zero equity, a king three off would have been a profitable call. But compared to the equity gain that we are gaining for the really pro probable collision, I think that the king three off is not going to gain me more equity than than if I'm just sitting it sitting the one out. And when you are saying that, yeah, even a fish can get supernova, yeah, it's true, actually. When I played, or when I played like hundred dollar hypers a while ago, you could see there, like, there are players that I don't think that are going to be, going to be that good, but when the buy-ins are going to be so high that they are playing like 100, 200 and 300 dollar games, they don't need to play that much to get the supernova, but it starts to get really expensive to get the 1 million VPP tag. And I don't think that I have ever seen a bad player with the 1 million VPP tag or supernova elite tags. I don't think that I have ever seen a bad player with those 
But with supernova tags, I have seen players that are are probably not that good. This is like the thin value that we can get called with something like King High or or weaker pair. If he shoves, we are going to we are going to fold. And Aristoteles says that, could you tell us please what would be our UTG range for the first one or two levels, six-handed? If you are having a holder resources calculator, I think the population plays against the UTG shove. They play actually, percentage-wise, they play quite close to Nash. So you can, you can go quite close to the Nash ranges from the two earliest positions. And I'm thinking that you are playing pretty well. Pretty well then. The calling ranges are needing more. But if I'm saying something like any pocket pair, any suited ace, ace eight off plus, king five suited plus, king ten off plus, queen ten off plus, queen eight suited, jack eight suited, ten eight suited, nine eight suited, eight seven suited. That's going to be about it. So like any suited hand with eight, uh, eight or a better card in it, eight and a higher card in it, and then every offsuit hand with ten or a higher card in it, and any suited days, any pocket pair. Yeah, ace two suited is better than ace eight off. But I think ace off is going to be profitable still. In here, we are having such a short attack on the table. We are not risking anything, even though it would be, even though it would be chaining, gaining chips. I don't think that we would be gaining equity. And this might have actually been a call that I missed. And like Aristoteles, it's also a problem because the first or. Uh, the first blind level is that we are going to be 10 big blinds deep, but the second blind level is going to be 50 to 100, so blinds double every blind level. So that's like the first blind level, and the second blind level you need to be a lot more aggressive if you are having the starting stack, or around starting stack. So you'll need to adjust your ranges, but most of the game is played in the, in the first I actually think that a7 off is going to be good enough against the button shove. And we got really lucky to have a double paired board. And I I think that po uh, Poker Stars had a blog post on for Andre Coimbra that plays in these games and his wife plays these games as well and it was about their workspace and they were having like a huge wallpaper of different graphs and like pre-calculated, I think pre-calculated spots that they could refer quickly to. And if I would play just these games, I would do a lot of work for figuring out the population tendencies and figuring out to what to do against someone that plays the population tendencies, what to do against a guy that plays loser, what to, do, what to do against a guy that would play pretty close to Nash. And then I would be... Then I would be doing a lot of those and I would be mostly doing those for the first two blind levels and then for the third blind level I would be looking at what kind of situations are the most usual situations I'm going to be in. Ouch. It's going to be a large spot. It's going to be... It's like, if it wouldn't be Jack Deuce, 
And if this guy would have like never limp, but when this guy's VPIP is higher than his PFR, I'm thinking that his limps are likely to be really weak. Actually, I think that Jack to do so would have been a profitable call. It's I think it's going to be closer than most of you think. In these games, it's going to be that you need to go for. You need to go for. Go for and calculate the situations beforehand. So, I think you may may be a fishy player if you are trying to find out on the table what you should do in a certain situation. You should search for the answers outside of the tables, and then when you are going to the tables, you should already know what's likely to be the answer. And in these games, it's going to be hard, like, you can't just go, like, be an idiot all the time, and you can't go, like, be really aggressive all the time, because you really need to learn to read the situation. In this situation, I folded, even though it would be profitable to probably call it, it would be making chips for sure. But if I'm having an equal stack sized player that has been folded a ton on my left side, my equity is going to be higher in these games than I would presume. And then when I say that there's a guy that has folded a ton, then he calls me next hand with five, five do suited. And that's kind of funny. As Kifosis, holy F, your is over 10 million VPPs. Yeah, I think he made like uh, one month, he made something like 1.3 million VPPs. It was one of those months with the scoop or scoop or W coop or T coop. I don't remember, but I remember seeing uh, like a horrible amount of VPPs, VPPs for the monthly counter. If the big blind would have been a fishy player, I think I have seen this B to the Fizzo on the tables a lot, so I'm trying to and when he when he shoves over the limp like in these games also when there's a player that has like just over the antes and he's all in on the pot your for example small blind shove range should tighten a lot because then you need to win that player before you can get any money in the game. Like, even though you are winning the big blind, most of the, or there's a lot of money in the antis and the small blind. And to be really aggressive on the small blind depends on that if you are not getting called, you are getting all the antis and you are getting all the big blind. But when there is someone already all in, you are not getting the value you are expecting for your steal. So... So that's also something that I think that is going to separate the really great players in these games from the just good players. That the really great players have calculated what it means... What it means to have a... What it means to have a player in that's what it means if there is a player in in the pot that's having a shorter stack i think it, when the button shoved it would be something like ace eight or ace six that i would have called but i think ace five is going to be it's going to ace five off is going to be too weak h5 suited i would have called against this guy because he has been so aggressive but it's just like it's not the only thing that we require. It, it's not enough that we are in ahead of him. We need to be ahead of him enough. But I think that's one of those spots that is going to be it's going to be quite close. 
Uh, this had been a limp spot that our opponent checked back to us and actually with king high I probably shouldn't have bet the turn because I'm having some showdown equity and when our opponent didn't bet it it's either that he's having a bad hand he could have hit the six like I think it doesn't make that much sense for him to him to check or something like check makes complete sense for him to check if he would be a good player and I think it's it's an okay check because then he'll get some value out of my my bluffs that I can do do on the turn and river but in these games I'm generally I'm not expecting my opponents to opponents to be knowledgeable and I don't expect my opponents to know that if they are having a medium strength hand they should probably check it here I'm more expecting that my opponents are going to are going to play like those seabed spots are going to play with more of a more of a linear range and they are going to bet their good hands more often than their weak hands and they are not likely that likely to polarize their seabedding range and then then going for checkbacks with the medium medium strength hands Hence, then, I, what I would expect if I'm having an opponent that that I would think to be good. But in these games, I think the first thing to get rid of is thinking that your average opponent would be good. If I'm seeing someone like with the Supernova Stripes here, or Supernova Stars, not Stripes, Stars, then I'm usually thinking that it's going to be more likely that he's a good player, but also if he's a good player... It's going to be more likely, but it's also, it can be that the player is not still a sit and go player. Or a player that would have... Would have taken his time to analyze these games, so... In this situation... Actually, even though King Jack off is going to be a good hand, and if this guy would have had a 500 chip stack, I would have shoved the King Jack. But when this guy is already all in, I don't think the shoving of the King Jack would be that profitable. Because we'll then need to beat this guy. And against the random range, yeah, we are getting close to 60-ish percent, but, percent. But then it's going to still be still be less equity than what we are getting against this guy in general because in general we are thinking that he's going to most of the time fold against the UTG shove and we are going to be ending this session soon it's going to be that I don't want to play the Tournament that these games are all for. Mm, Ace Jack off. Against one player for sure, against two players I'm unsure. I'm thinking that it's better to fall because I think if this player is a random and this player is supernova, so she, he sh should be more likely than average to know something. I'm not thinking that if this guy is likely to be tighter than he should be, then the supernova is probably calling him tighter than in general. So, and Ace Jack off, if someone is shoving tighter than they should be, and someone is calling that should know that the opponent is probably shoving tighter than they should be, then Ace then off is going to, is not going to be a profitable shove. And even though I think Aristoteles or Skifosis said that the Sunday 500 hypers are running as well. Yeah, but we are going to... I think that these games, if you are playing them with money and if you are playing them with FPPs, they are going to be completely different games. And as I said, that the money hypers are always going to be harder hypers than these VPP hypers. So... So with these VPP hypers, we are going to have a 
I think we are going to have a more exploitative strategies in these games than we would have in the Money Hypers. Yeah, it was Ace Jack off. I still think that think that Ace Jack off is going to be is going to be too too wide to call. It's going to be nasty because there's there are so many draws that our opponent can have in here. And as there are so many draws, I'm thinking that Wow. I would expect our opponents to and in here we can get the money if we are not taking part of that, but we are getting such a great price and if you are just checking it through we are gaining actually a lot of equity. And I don't think that it matters that much even though we are going to be we are going to be the shorter stack on the bubble but we would always be the shorter stack. So it's actually a bit close and I think that when we added uh, when we added two cards that our opponents need to dodge it's going to it's going to affect their ranges. But I'd say that also the money hypers could probably be an interesting idea to discuss later on. I just think that those are going to be games that are are not that enticing for the players that we are having on PokerIMania.com. I don't think that... I'm thinking like in these FPP hypers, we are having a lot of players that can have a lot of... a lot of advantage trying to learn these FPP hypers, but for the gas, cash hypers, I think it's going to be less players that would gain in in those of course if we are having bloggers and interested players we could also try to try to look at the cash hypers and i might even dust the dust the database and look through a bit on how the how the fpp hypers and how the cash hypers differ from each other And like, like I have said, against unknown opponents or opponents that are folding more than, more than about one third of their big blinds, I think that we can. A nasty spot again. There's an opponent that limps that hasn't limped that much before. A eight off. It's. Also going to be nasty, but against the tight player, I don't think it makes that much sense going for it. Against the player that has been really aggressive, I don't think that we should be min raising that, and I don't think that we should be shoving that as he don't. He doesn't seem to like folding. King eight, three people remaining. And when the guys are going to have about equal stacks, then I'm starting to be a bit more aggressive in the in the bottom left. If it would be like he would have 900 chips and this guy would have 200 chips, it would be an incredible spot to add some ICM pressure onto that guy if he knows what his situation is, because he could call like pocket kings or better. But... If the guy doesn't know what he's doing, he can call with something like pocket eights and then we are both losing and this guy is gaining equity. So we are going to not abuse the bubble as much as we would against a knowing opponent. I think the next games are going to be the last games that I'm starting. I'm going to take some games on the, on the side so we are getting the four tables going as far away in the future as we can. 
Like I'm trying to get about seven tables running. If we are having an unknown player, I'm thinking that he's probably limping weaker hands. And Ahille said, next coaching you are playing 50-50s. If you are interested in seeing 50-50s, add them or suggest them in the, in the feedback thread and I might. I usually I don't have a program scheduled on what do I... It's usually what I'm thinking that people might be interested in seeing or... or like this is just because I think that these games are... These games are quite fun and yesterday I played these during the Supernova free roll and I thought that this might be nice games. Nice games for tomorrow's session. And like the, the, during the start of the session I remembered yeah, when Sunday Storm is running, these Sunday Storm hypers aren't running, but we got a really nice session out of the out of the point hypers still. And this haven't been my main game, but I have been when I have played this 235 VPP or FPP cash hypers, I have been cashing in about 30 36 percentage in these games, so. So I think I know what I'm doing. Against a guy that would shove like close to any two, that would be a really easy call, but then again, if we are having a guy that is probably folding too much on our left, then we are not willing to take that much risks. Risk and especially if the guy is not going to not going to seem that aggressive that shoves, so then we are not going to, like, that would be an easy Nash call against the Villain Meng, but we are throwing Nash out of the window. The window is actually on that side, but you can't see the, see the room anyway. Ace Queen, it's really nasty. That's probably the hand that I'm most unsure about, that if it's a profitable Profitable or unprofitable call. And that is always what you should do. Like you can see me marking hands like when I'm un unsure about if the hand is a profitable hand or not. Then I'm marking it and I'm trying to check it as quick as I, I can. And as they have said, the part two of the 50-50 coaching is published soon. Sounds great. And in here, I actually... I could just limp and try to get this guy to shove his rest of his chips in. And now it's going to be an easy game. Like in... in on the surface it looked like, yeah, shove. Shoving is going to be profitable. But when you're looking at a bit closer, then let's keep this guy in and let's... And in here also it should be just checking it to the river. And this is something that you'll need to, need to just know. If you are having opponents that are regs in the game, then it's going to be easier because then you know that the guys are, are going to check it to the river. And against some less reggy guys, it's sometimes that they are calling, then they are bluffing on the flop and shoving you out, and then it's then it will be really frustrating. So it's not without risks. But usually if you are gaining equity in those situations, you should take the equity you are gaining. And especially if you are the second largest stack and the biggest stack is going to give you equity. If the biggest stack is giving you equity, you should just be thankful and take all the equity that they are giving away. Ace four off is going to be a profitable hand, but if I limp here and this guy shoves and this guy 
calls. I can't call and and I don't think it would be that profitable. With the even stack situation, we should be the one that's going to be the aggressive guy and try to get the head start on our opponents. And that backfired in a spectacular way, but that's the general theory of how, how we should play. Like if we are the second stack, we are going to be, we are going to be so tight. And if we are, if we are something like the, like about equal stacks, then we want to rise up rise over to other guys by playing playing aggressive and the B to the Fizzo this is also like this is a reverse situation I'm having a guy that doesn't like to fold on my left so I need to take a tougher spot in that hand like I think that this is going to be a really thin call but in this tournament my seat is worth less than ICM would dictate because if I'm having a short stack and I'm having a player that doesn't like to fold on my left side, then it's going to be a harder situation for me to me to gain equity in that tournament. And there's actually been a, a ton of hyper turbo specific situations in these games. Like the same situations apply to other hyper turbos like cash satellite hyper turbos, the cash hyper turbos, like what you are going to think about with really short stacks. It also applies to some turbo, regular turbo sit and goes. And it affects on those turbo sit and goes that you are. It affects those regular sit and goes that you are you are getting to to a situation that you are really short stacked and but in in turbo and regular speed it happens a lot less than in than it happens in It happens a lot less than it would happen happen in a hyper turbo. And I think that today we played something like we opened about one hour, one a bit over one hour. And these graphs are always going to be so nice when there is like no variance in the graphs. You are always going up when you are playing. You are always going up when you are playing playing free rolls. That's the nice part of free rolls. As we can see, I think it's 24 first place finishes. And when it's going to be 24 first place finishes in in 65 games. And the ITM is going to it's going to lie a bit. And 24 it means $264. Let me have a calculator in here. Like if we are looking at today, we used 65 times 235 and it's going to be, give me another calculator. This is like, this is nice when you are having a computer. You can always have as many calculators as you would like. If we are calculating that we got $264 out of 15,000 chips. Uh, 15,275 VPPs, then it's going to be like uh, 0 0.0172. So we did like 1.2 cents more, no, 0 0.12 cents more per every VPP we played this way. Like if we are comparing that to if we would use the money to buy a supernova, Give me another calculator. So this is 
Now we are having so many calculators that we are confused. If we are using the same same amount in supernova bonus, it would be 0 0.016. So we would get 20 bucks less. So it's like 20 bucks for an hour. It's not worth it if you are a profitable poker player that makes more than the $20. But to play four tables of these. And of course, I played four tables, so that that also matters. And if we are comparing to something else, like if we are comparing it to the gold star bonus, if we would have just gold stars, it would be, I think, 12 point or 0 0.0125. So, with a, comparing to a gold star bonus, with uh, one hour of playing these games, four tables, we would be making $74 more. So, this is the reason why you should play... This is the reason why you should play these hyper turbos rather than buy the bonuses. And even though $20 on top of the Supernova bonus doesn't sound that much, but the $70 on top of the on top of the Gold Star bonus, they would be actually something, and then it would be actually pretty great to play these games rather than going for the Supernova bonuses. And or going for the Gold Star bonuses. And if you're playing sit and goes, you can like when you are playing a set of sit and goes. When you are having something like if you are used to playing 10 tables, when you are going down to that you are having only 3 tables running, you can open with your FPPs, you can open a, open as many of those 235 FPP games that you, you can. And when you are playing those games, you are like constantly converting your rake back. So you are constantly getting... You are constantly getting your rake back out of out of stars, and then you are also not using extra time in playing for the playing for the hypers. So then you are just using the time that you would anyway be playing a low amount of tables, and and you are gaining some extra equity in playing those playing those FPPs out at the same time as you would usually be just twiddling your thumbs or going on Skype or doing something something unprodu un unproductive. And as we had some hands that we marked, and this is something that I like to do post-session, that if I had marked a lot of hands post-session, I want to go through them as quickly as possible so that I remember on what did we do. So let's have the hands report. I have only two marked hands today. Okay. This is the first hand that we are we have marked and this was I think this was about unknown player shoves for about 20 big blinds should we call with ace queen off and I think that the guys are probably shoving shoving in a quite the first stupid range like there are some guys that if you are telling that hey we are playing a hyper they are thinking that hey, I need to shove or fold every hand and I think in those games you can still gain some extra equity if you know when you should limp and when you should min raise and like the most important situations when you should min raise or limp are when you are having a short stack near the bubble and you would gain if the guys behind you would collide rather than you being there or when there are two players that have, that have doubled up usually shoving doesn't make that much sense because people are not three betting enough anyway. And so this is satellite and we are basically having a two. But you can also make a structure like in these games the hyper turbo satellite is it's about 700 FPPs worth the, for the first and second place and 10 FPPs for the last. So the correct structure in for these 235 FPP games would be 700, 710. And it, it is really close to 1-1 one, one structure. Or, or a structure of satellite that there will be only two money finishes. 
If my dreams to fly would shove 42%, that's not going to happen. I think that he's going to shove less. Then ace queen off would be horrible call. Let's see that. Can we? Or let's just edit the range to 100%. Would it be profitable even against 100%? In general, if something is not profitable against 100%, then we are knowing that it isn't profitable and it's not even close to profitable, so I'm really happy that I folded this. And I don't even understand why I why I did it. And this is also this is a hand that we are having a way weaker hand, but one third of our stack is already in. And in general, if we are having the last place finish and one third of our stack is already in the big blind, we can't fold. And we are looking like we need only 29% pot odds, but there will be some ICM tax in here. When I'm seeing 29%, it's going to be really nasty. Really nasty because I don't think that with Jack Deuce off, we are going to get much more than 30% against pretty much any range, so I think this is also a good fold. But these are these are things that these are so easy to check that it's going to be just laziness if you are not going to check it. And Ahille said that if the edge is too small then it's better to fold. Yeah, it's going to be, there are going to be situations that there are going to be situations that we want to be calling with some minus EV spots because of the future game. And I discussed a lot about those spots today. And there are also some situations that you want to be calling calling tighter because the future game is going to be so profitable for you. Like those two games that we are having a needy player to our left. So why should we call in a bubble a shove from our right? If we can shove a ton on our left and gain some chips that we shouldn't gain, gain in a general game. So if catch up is shoving 34%, then it's going to be to check two's off is going to be really horrible, and it's just like in general it's going to be, it's going to be a situation. This is actually really, really interesting. If catch up shoves any two. Then pocket aces are unprofitable for Romana to call. And if he shoves any two, then Jack Deuce off is going to be going to be a good call. And we can plot range versus hand equities on like when it does become a good call. Queen two two off I would have called, I think. But Jack Deuce off not. And we can see that it requires actually 72.5% and about 55% or 57.5% so probably queen two's off is not going to be profitable call but I think that if we are folding that situation we are having next to no fold equity on the next hand I think it's going to be it's going to be better to take some minus equity edge on the exact hand and Aristoteles wow this ace queen fold made me feel Confused, because sometimes I would call there, but not always. And I'd say that now you can pretty much see that if you are calling any time there with ace queen off, it's not going to be profitable. I think something like pocket tens and better would be the profitable. And Aristoteles said that for sure I should work with this home resources calculator. Yeah. I think it's the best equity calculator that's currently available. And I think there are like three equity calculators that I think that are good for general sit and goes. I like Holden Resources Calculator myself. And they are having like the two week trial that you can get every six months. So even if you are you don't have money to buy it i recommend that you use the trial for your full advantage and there are a ton of videos that we have used holder resources calculator and i think most of the guys that have used the holder resources calculator trial have carried on because it's really an awesome tool and when you when you're using it for analysis it, it i think it's worth the monthly fee at all the higher levels then there's icmizer 
and I haven't used it that much, but I think it's going to be pretty much the second best best tool that it can handle three bet situations. It calculates really effective really effective ranges, and they are having a different kind of free trial. For free, you can analyze three hands every day, and I think that's awesome because it's also motivation to go through at least those three hands a day. And that's something that's going to be really, really profitable. Then there's the sit and go solver. That's the third one that I recommend. And there are a lot of useful graphs like you are, there are something that, some things that I haven't seen on any other, any other calculator that makes it really good. But then it can't handle, for example, three bet hands. So, so I think it's probably the easiest to use, but it's also the most limited. And Ahille asks, like, Isimizer isn't better. I think those are going to be the two best softwares available right now. And I like Holder Missiles Calculator. I know guys that are swearing by Isimizer. But as there, there is a trial possibility for both of those, I recommend to check them both out. And Aristoteles, thanks for coming in the live stream. Live stream and... Also, thanks for everybody else to, that took part of the chat today, because it's always easier to be here when there is active people in the chat. And usually there, are, there is someone that notices a mistake that I wouldn't probably notice myself. So, thanks everyone. And I'd like to remind that during next week on Tuesday, we are having an English cash games coaching by You Lost Bro. So that's going to be something that we haven't had in a long time in English. I hope to see a lot of you there that are interested in cash games or some deeper stacked deeper stacked tournament games because practically deeper stacked tournament play and cash games are going to be mathematical quite equivalent. And also next week we are having our pot limit Omaha night on Wednesday and we are having some sit and goes again on Sunday. So, this is time for me to end. If you are going to sleep, have a good night. And if you are still playing poker, may this be a winning night for you. Bye!